Hello everyone and welcome to Playtime Online, a webinar series from Institute of Play that covers a range of topics at the intersection of games and learning. I'm Elena Parker, the producer of this program. Today we are talking about how to effectively integrate digital games and learning tools into your teaching practice. This topic was requested by teachers from Scarsdale Middle School as part of a series of PD workshops that the Institute partnered with Scarsdale to provide. We'd like to extend a warm and special welcome to the Scarsdale teachers watching with us here today. In just a moment, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator and today's panel. Before we get started, I'd like to remind our viewers that at any point you'd like to ask today's speakers a question, just click on the blue participate text under this video on the right-hand side. We'll be spending the last 15 minutes or so in the webinar answering questions during our Q&A portion. And now, over to you, Dan. As part of a series of PD workshops that the Institute partnered with Scarsdale to provide. We'd like to extend a warm and special welcome to the Scarsdale teachers watching us here today. In just a moment, I have the pleasure of introducing a model. Before we get started, I'd like to remind our viewers that at any point you'd like to ask today's speakers a question, Hey Dan, you're muted. Thank you, that's great. So I was muted the entire time. Hi, so I'm Dan. Um, I'll try and have you read my lips again. So I'm a learning designer from Institute of Play and I work uh, mainly within Quest to Learn School in New York City and I work with teachers all the time developing and implementing game-like uh, learning and curriculum with students there. Uh, we also do a lot of work with teachers outside of our district. And a shout out and hello to Scarsdale teachers. Uh, I'm really happy you guys are seeing us, um, although I can't see you. Uh, we're going to go around quickly and introduce uh, the people on this panel here. And let's start with the Tanya, if you can quickly say what you do and who you are. Hi, my name is Tanya. I am the upper school Spanish teacher. I teach levels one and two. Claudio. Hi, I'm Claudio Midolo. Uh, I'm a game designer in Michelab, and I work with all the teachers and the learning designer to design all the games and game-like experiences. Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Mueller. I teach eighth grade uh, Code Worlds, which is a math and language class at Quest to Learn. And Tamash. Hi, everyone. My name is Tamash, Tamash McCanny. I'm learning designer at Glass Lab. All right, so, so let me just frame this a little before we get into it. Um, we are talking about integrating digital tools, technologies, games uh, into the classroom. So you could do this in a whole lot of ways, and you can talk about a whole lot of things. There are um, whole conferences, books, and diplomas devoted to this kind of thing. So let's not pretend we're going to get everywhere. So let's, we're just going to focus on some examples uh, of tools that these teachers and designers have worked with in the past and have had challenges, successes um, with and find interesting. Um, we're going to describe them, why they were chosen, whether they were modified in any way, how they were used, uh, and our basic goal is going to be to see what common themes emerge from these examples and to kind of try to latch onto those themes to see if we can get anywhere. Um, Participants, when you talk about either your examples or when we are having general conversation, please try to speak to these three things. I'm reading from my little list. Why you chose this tool or why you made it or why you modified it. Um, what did this tool let students do that they couldn't have otherwise done? We assume that there was quite a bit of play. So we're going to start with Chris. And yes, I am unmuted. That's good. So Chris, we were talking earlier about um, an example uh, that we actually worked on together last year. Chris and I worked as a learning team. Um, do you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. So we worked, as in the eighth grade class, we worked on sort of a classic problem that um, teachers and students explore to look at ideas like slope and the y-intercept on a graph and, and also um, linear equations, of, like systems of linear equations. <clears throat> the problem relates to um, two brothers who are having a race and one is quite a bit faster than the other. And so the question has students think about where, 
you know, how much head start should um, the, the faster brother give the slower brother so they have a competitive race. <clears throat> um, last year, I wanted, you know, to make it sort of more digitally interesting and, and engaging for students, so we thought of a way to have them solve the problem and then communicate the problem like almost like a, a storybook. And so one of the things we did last year was had students take photographs using some, some Lego friends of the story. So that you know you see the two brothers on the starting line, you see them sort of racing and crossing. And so then the students would narrate the story with those Lego Lego guys and create a digital um, picture book. And they could they could justify their solution and, and do the mathematics <clears throat> in sort of a more engaging way. Now that was that was fun and there was felt like there was a little bit of play there because they had toys in their hands and they got to <clears throat> illustrate what they were doing. But we wanted to make it a little bit more engaging, a little bit more play-like. And so what we ended up doing um, was we wrote a program. I worked with Claudio and um, Dan, and we wrote a program in uh, processing, which is a, a, so a coding tool. And what it allows the students to do is play with literally play with the variables and explore what happens. And so you can see here there is the different variables. They, how many um, meters of a head start, where should the finish line be, how fast can the two brothers go. So it really puts the power in the students' hands of being able to play with all these different things. And that's all they have to do. They don't have to know how to code or anything. They just have to know how to change those numbers. And when they do that, they get this screen here, which allows them to actually test out those numbers and see the race unfold. So we just thought that that really made it this problem, which is a classic problem used in pre-algebra classes around the country, like make it come alive for students and really give them a lot more ability to explore, play with the problem, and tinker with it, and really understand the, um, the concepts. Um, were there any challenges associated with the the creation of that tool that you made, or the implementation of it? Uh, I, I, either the the initial tool or the second tool. So the initial tool of the the photographs of the Lego pieces, you know, that ended up taking quite a bit of class time to do. Like the kids explored the math, of course, which was, you know which was really important, but then the time to take the photographs, upload the photographs, bring them into editing software and presentation software, that ended up taking quite a few class periods that I felt like they weren't, they were no longer doing the math, they were just creating the communication. Um, the, the challenge is with, I had to learn how to write a program in processing, um, you know, so that was a little bit of time on my own, of my own to learn how, how that syntax worked and um, Claudio, again, was very helpful because he's, he's quite good at it. So being able to work as on a learning team with him really helped out. Um, but then once, you know, once that was shown to students, that was a lot more direct for them. They could, they could approach the math task with a lot fewer barriers. Okay. Um, let me ask can you a question. A question? Um, can I ask a question from Christoph? Um, I mean, I, I, I like this for multiple reasons, and one of the things that, at least talking to, uh, to, to teachers who are c contemplating and wanting to use digital technology would ask with a, question, with a game like this, is like, oh, but it's such a basic graphics, Chris. Like, will the, will the, will the kids like that? or would even be they engaged with that low fidelity graphics. Can you talk to that, please? Because I think it's mu much more authentic coming from you than from us. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think kids are used to so many great graphics in, in programs nowadays. I think I saw um, a t-shirt the other day that said, you know, I would go outside, but the graphics are terrible. Um, <laughs> um, so I, but I think if they know that the teacher like designed it, and it, they know it's something I built to share with them. They're pretty excited about that idea. And, and frankly, the, the 
interactivity in that program is pretty cool. Like the just being able to see what happens when you play with the numbers and have it just instantly play out in front of you. I think they're okay with just it being a stick figure. Yeah, with the uh, sorry, Dan, I keep cutting you off, but with the uh, <laughs> you know with the danger of might sounding like a, a smarty pan here, um, that that totally resonates with the literature and what the you know like the academics would say. Like every single every single paper and 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 um, research around digital games point to the fact that instead of having high fidelity graphics. Try to have your interactions real time and the feedback as immediate as possible. So when you have the focus there, what you did, rather than creating some really fancy, good-looking, you know, uh, nice sound thing, it it's probably work better for, especially for an educational purpose, but also for an engagement purpose. So I just really like that starting point. Back to Dan. Unmute here. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Tomas. Uh, feel free to jump in. Anybody else too? Uh, it doesn't have to just be Tomas jumping ahead of me. Um, so I can I can share something yes. on, uh, going on with continuing Tomas' point around real time feedback over graphics. I would like to show something about that we did with uh, the science teacher using uh, an application called Algodoo. Um, I'm going to start my screen share right now. And basically, in this application, you you are able to use uh, and play with the law of physics uh, in a very playful way, but also very concrete way too. And the feedback the feedback is exactly what Tamash was saying. It's immediate. It's in real time. So the learning goal in this scenario here was about uh, having the kids model a very real world and kind of complex problem in New York City which is called combined sewage outflow. It's uh, basically what happens when a lot of rain in very little time comes down and basically overflows all the sewage system and because of that a lot of pollution comes from the city directly out in the in the river. So it's kind of a big problem and you know uh, the tools here you can see what's basically simulation what's happening and it's in real time. You can play and pause the animation. And you know, in order to simulate something like this, uh, it's kind of complex and usually requires very expensive software. But thanks to Algodoo, uh, we are able to we were able to build together, the teacher and I, uh, this scenario, and the kids were able to actually see what happens. So you see the water, there was a lot of water in very little amount of time, and because of that, the sewage system becomes clogged. And on the right you see a lot of that um, additional water being discharged in the river and also that brown particles are the pollution. And so this way the kids were able to in real time see the situation and apply changes to it and see for example proposed solutions of how to stop this problem, how to design the sewer in a different way. And so as you can see the graphics is really really basic, it's just simple shapes and textures but because it was so, you know, free form and real time, but yet still powerful, it was you know, incredibly successful. Claudia, what would you say uh, students who used that tool, Algodoo, in that particular simulation, were able to do or make that they weren't able to do otherwise? Well, for sure. Uh, imagine, so that model was to scale. So the buildings and the amount of water were basically to scale. The building were, were like 30 to 50 meters high and the waste was to scale. The sewage system was actually taken from a picture of like the, the blueprint of one, simplified obviously, but still with the same logic. And so they were basically able to, be, to, to play and work in a space that was a, a simulation of what they could find in the real world. So if you had to, you know, test that uh, your idea is to find a solution to that problem in, in a smaller, you know, in, in a classroom, what can you do? You need to have water, you need to, you know, it's much more difficult to manage. While with that tool they were empowered to to use that digital space to, to propose a real world solution to a problem. So I'm seeing the concept of rapid prototyping and revision being yeah. something that you're pointing to? Yeah, and also like being able to play with something that is not available to you, like how can you find 
uh, a, a building that tall that you can work with? How can you find so much water to work with? How can you build that? It's difficult. You need materials. So it's also, it was also giving in a, in a nice package, friendly package, a lot, of, a lot of tools and components to work with immediately. All right. Thank you. I want to come back uh, in a second, or not in a second, but I just want to reserve space at some point for uh, talking a little bit more about the balance between making it yourself and taking someone else's, because I know Chris talked about how the students were engaged by the fact that he made it. Um, I'd like to come back to that, but maybe it's part of the next thing which I'm going to push us to, which is taking the uh, the fi finding the graphics that are better than the real world, which might be the case with Minecraft. Um, so I know, Atanya, you had something about Minecraft that you might want to share with us. And yeah, you're so yeah, I got it. <laughs> so for my year two students, um, we for our mission, we um, were in Costa Rica and we were working for um, a, a tourist company. And so basically, what they had to do for their final delivery was they had to create a their own hotel and create a tour guide of of the hotel. It was like a video, like a, a virtual video of their hotel, um, and. Basically, what they ended up doing, um, they had a blast with it, but they had to um, d make a blueprint of their hotel. They learned words such as like um, things that you would do, like when you're going on vacation. They learned traveling words. Um, they also learned like um, words inside of a what you would find inside of a hotel. Um, and so basically, after they created their blueprint of their hotel, they wrote down for my students, my struggling students, um, I, they were given a lot of sentence starters to create um, using their blueprint. They were creating like, okay, so um, I'll start out by saying welcome to, and they they named their hotel, welcome to Pura Vida. That was the hotel that we stayed at. Um, to your left, you'll see here the main lobby um, and, and whatnot. And so for my students who were more advanced, they wanted to take an extra step after designing their blueprint and actually designing their hotel on Minecraft. They wanted to take the extra step and do like a live tour. So they didn't want to have the, the sentence starters or the script um, there in front of them. They wanted to, to have that extra challenge and to um, go and, and do it like freestyle live. So um, they had a blast with it. And I was a little nervous at first, but it was, it was good to see um, them having a good time in the classroom. For those listening that don't, or either forgot or don't realize, this was in Spanish or partially in Spanish, or because I didn't actually see it, see this happen. So they were giving their tours in, in Spanish. I'm taking it in Spanish, completely in Spanish. Actually, oh. I have the video. If you want, Tonya, I can show the video that we uh, oh, created yeah. together. Okay, I can show the video now, or just a part of it. Mm. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So you should now see the video here. And Atani, if you want to describe the video. Mm -hmm. And we're going to hope that it's not choppy, but yeah. Yeah. So um, there, I can't really see. It's really small. I can make it bigger. Oh. There you go. So yeah, this was um, the basically the model that I had for them. This is what I showed them. Like, okay, this is what you guys are going to be doing, and this is um, this is basically going to be your final delivery. So um, I'm basically telling them like, uh, welcome to Pura Vida. Here we have our lake um, at the hotel, and let's keep going forward. And then now we're turning to the left. Like they were also learning like directions, like going straight, going forward, um, left turn, right turn. Um, so we get here, and now we're at our entrance, and I'm just there saying in Spanish, um, this is our entrance to the hotel. Um, here, I think this is like the restaurant. Here, you can eat here. The types of foods we have are, they would name like a couple of foods that they had, and let's go inside and see what the cook is, what the chef is cooking today. So it was really cool. It was really fun to see them um, do this. So this is cool to see. Um, were students, so for those... Again, people who don't know Minecraft that well, uh, a lot of the time students are making things inside of Minecraft. Was this more something that was made that they uh, described? Were they making as well? Or was this like kind of a pre-made thing that they just got dropped into? They, um, 
the, Claudio <laughs> completely yeah. made mine since I'm like new, I was new. I'm new at this actually, and I'll um, even share my experience of like just bringing this into the classroom and being like scared out of my mind because I. I wasn't familiar with Minecraft and I had never used it before so I didn't know what to expect but the students um, this actual group of students that I had were very familiar with this so I did get lucky so they went in and they built from scratch their actual hotel some of the hotels were obviously not um, as detailed as this and I even um, told them to just try to keep it simple um, just so that they wouldn't spend so much time in the design process but um, yeah, like I said, like as an educator, um, my experience, like I was really nervous. I was like, look, Claudio, like it'd be great to use this, but I've never, I don't know a lot about Minecraft and I just don't like the feeling of like going into the classroom and not being completely like in control and confident about something. So, um, Claudio was there to like, to help me the first couple of times, but the students though, this is like when I really learned, um, that the students actually kind of liked to, to see, oh, um, Senora, she doesn't know everything. Here, Senora, let me help you out with this. So it was really cool to like see them step up and actually teach me and show me things like, oh, if you want to um, fly, you do this. If you want to um, go into the pool, you do that. So it was really cool to see them step up and, and teach me. <laughs> how, did, um, how did you get convinced to use this? How did Claudio uh, strong arm you into using this? Gosh. He, be, I was convinced to use this because um, after seeing the the, um, the hotel that Claudio created, I was like, oh my gosh, how can I not use it? But the fact that he was like, you know what, I'll be there um, the first couple of classes to to just for support and just knowing that I would have that um, did let me it it did allow me and I felt comfortable like kind of stepping out on my shell, but. Um, stepping out of my um, shell, but even if I didn't have um, Claudio support, like, because I know if other teachers um, plan on using Minecraft in the future and they won't have um, the awesome Claudio by their by their side to help them, um, it's really cool to know that if sometimes like your students, they they if they know a lot about Minecraft, then give them the opportunity to to step up and, and take charge of something and lead. Or if you don't have students um, who know that, then there's always like a lot of um, just other ways that you can get that support. But I would just say to reach out to the students and see if you have any who are like Minecraft geniuses. Hey, hey Antonio. Hey, um, I guess it's a question for you as well as even the audience at one point. Um, that what do you think as you said, like most of most most of most of your fellow teachers don't have an awesome Claudio by their sides. So what can we do, in your opinion, that's the most comforting? What can we designers do to help it, you know, make these uh, make these experiences the smoothest possible? So I'm thinking around like PD opportunities, which, you know, everybody at uh, the Institute of Play is really putting a lot of emphasis. But what are those kind of props and helps that you think are the most useful um, and that's certainly something that 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 uh, we can discuss what makes it what PD materials makes the best use for digital games I think what really really helped me was when Claudia was like alright I'm not gonna be there um, the fact of having a cheat sheet like so I had like a um, basically it was like directions like verbatim, word for word, like, you do go, um, go onto Mac, go to the spotlight search, click, type in, like, it was literally, like, word for word. That really, like, was really reassuring to me, and it, it just helped me out a lot, having that cheat sheet there. So I think maybe, um, having a couple of PDs about, um, around it, but also, like, giving teachers, like, a reference sheet to go to, um, it's really helpful. Thanks. Am I still mute? Oh, thanks. Chris, I thought I unmuted myself. Chris, I'd like to ask you to respond to what Atani was talking about with with regard to the students kind of helping her learn or not actually liking when this teacher didn't know everything. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty I, I kind of got a little theory that like, you know, when when technology is new to the teacher but the students know about it, it's, it's kind of pushing the teacher towards student-centered teaching a little. And I want to know how true that actually feels, or whether it's generally just overwhelming. Or um, does what does it you know, What do you think about what Tony said? So I, 
I hear her and I feel that I feel that's um, that's pretty common. I've certainly had those thoughts myself, like to to walk in and not be sure what's going to happen <laughs> in your class, even though you're you're really sure of your learning goals, you're really sure of what the outcomes you want for the students, like to not be completely confident in the, the materials you're using can be scary, um, for sure. And it, I think that's one of the great things about the digital world is the kids have grown up, our students now have grown up with digital their whole life. Um, so they are, they're not afraid of it. And they, even if they don't know what they're doing, they are so comfortable in that world of, of just playing and fiddling with things until they figure it out that they they love to share with each other and share with you. So you become that interaction, that um, relationship of like, here, let me show you how this works. They've been doing it since they, they were five, and they're just very comfortable doing that with teachers as well. Um, so I think, you know, I was reflecting on Tamasha's question to Tanya a moment ago. Um, you know, what supports can do teachers need, I think, to, to embrace these tools is just to think of them as, as any other tool, as a, you know, just like you know, a textbook or a novel. You know, those are, they're just tools that you need to harness in your own way, like figure out what it is, what are your learning goals and, and how to harness this resource. And I think if, if teachers can think of it in that way, then they're not as scary. Let me just read out some themes that I've been following, and then I'm going to ask Tamash, unless someone has something to respond to with these themes, uh, just to provide a bit of an example of what you're working with, in case people aren't that familiar with it. Um, I'm noticing people talking about time, having it be a good use of time for students. Uh, there seems to be something important about who makes the technology and whether students know about that um, and whether they're making something with the technology or not. There seems to be something strong about uh, the interactivity of the technology, whether students get immediate feedback on, on what they're trying to do, uh, whether there's tweaking. Uh, it seems like a simulated space gives uh, the ability to rapidly prototype or change things uh, or make things that aren't necessarily possible with the tools that are normally at our, at our, at our hands or fingers. <laughs> um, there's, there's clearly risk and fear involved with teachers that are learning to use new tools, perhaps with students as well. Um, I'm wondering about um, whether the, the experimentation with that risk and that fear helps teachers get closer to what students feel sometimes, because I know there's a lot of fear that students have, whether it's social or uh, metacognitive stuff, um, and I'm very curious about that relationship, whether it helps teachers empathize with that kind of stuff. Um, uh, it seems that the students are teaching teachers sometimes when new technologies are used. Uh, I think I've hit my list from what's been kind of coming up here. So I'd like to invite anybody to respond to any of those themes that seem to resonate um, before we go on to our next example. And please do respond if you'd like to. Um, I'll respond. I think um, I was actually really glad that I went through this experience and like being like scared out of my wits um, the day before. Um, I knew I would be using Minecraft in the classroom because it really allowed me to um, see what a lot of my students go through who are in my level one class where they come in and they've never even spoken um, another language before um, um, and they've never even heard Spanish so they come in and they're, pro they're like um, scared and nervous and don't know what to expect so it allowed me to just um, get a sense of what my, my level one students go through. Yeah, I think, um, you know, a moment ago I was sort of downplaying the fear students have. I think they've grown up with technology, so they're not afraid of, of a new app on their iPad or a new, um, a new game that they purchase. But I do think that they have that same fear that we have, you know, when they sit down for an algebra class or if they sit into their, their first day of chemistry class in 10th grade. Like, I think they don't know the rule. They don't know how to fiddle and play and learn. Um, in that setting. So I think, you know, I, I think as much as we can kind of cross those two worlds together for the students, so they can see that learning is the same as it is when they have an iPad app. You know, the more, that's why 
we're seeing success. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just um, trying to respond and remember Dan's questions uh, while he rejoins us. But um, I, I, there's a quote from uh, from from a researcher who's like one of the very fundamental researcher in in uh, in learning games, uh, particularly digital games, um, Jim G. And and one of a really good quote from him. Uh, in his 2003 book, it says that good video games incorporate good learning principles. So, so the the idea is that if you play if you play a game, um, then and and it really captivates you and it really keeps you going, then that's really what what good learning is does the same the same way, right? So if you're if you enjoy if you enjoy the the things you're learning and and we all do. Everybody does. Uh, then, then you just have to merge those two together. So have have those have those lo good learning principles uh, drive the game that you're that you're that you're using in your classroom. And so it becomes less of a less of a a, a distance between between a video game and and classroom experiences, and more focused on, hey, it's just learning in one context and learning in the other. And so I, I guess I just made my own uh, bridge to uh, to to some examples of uh, Glass Eleven. I see Dan nodding, so I, I make the go ahead with that. And um, nice and wanted to wanted to um, bring an example that I'm sure those of you who have uh, been to Playtime Online before have seen, um, and our SimCity EDU. Game and, and I'm not going to actually try to focus on a, a slightly different angle than, than previously we talked about it and, and want to, to focus on on um, some of the uh, the strong the positives and as well as the the challenges of, of having a really strong you know high fidelity high fidelity game and, and what can it do um, to help uh, you know that tool be used in a classroom, and as an example. So, what well, what I was trying to do here, and and this may or may not go well, is I'm going to share a two minute, um, very brief video with you guys, and um, in case you don't see it or it's choppy or or not working well, I apologize. And then we, Elena is going to share the link with everybody after after um, this uh, discussion. So just bear with us for two minutes, OK? The real world has um, some of the same problems that um, SimCity has. When I'm playing the game, it actually feels like I'm actually like in the world trying to make like the citizens happy. Some missions are very challenging, and they take lots of thought. But in some missions, like the first beginning missions, there just to teach you how, what to do. I've been beta testing SimCity EDU in the classroom for about two weeks with over 200 seventh and eighth graders and I'm seeing the level of engagement skyrocketing and instead of maybe only having a 75 percent attention rate I now have 110. Every kid is engaged, every kid wants to use the mouse, every kid wants to help solve the mission and it's amazing. Here, my turn. Let's build some more roads so we can build more. Let's extend it out. Industrial just gets more energy. Yeah. We exit out of the and more operation. We don't have any pollution, but we need more jobs. And it's commercial that gets us more jobs. Yeah. I just like how it's like your own world and you can create what you want to. It helps a lot. And I, I, I would do it on my free time if I had. I actually really do think about um, the real city and how how life would actually be by doing this. I thought it'd just be a game, but I'd be like, why am I feeling so bad for these people? At the same time of you being really educated by it, it's really fun, too. I do feel like I'm playing a role while I'm playing the game. At our age, it's usually the teachers or principals or parents that are in charge, and finally, like, being in charge for once is kind of cool. Okay. So, um, I hope... I hope you could follow it. And every time I watch it, I'm, I'm like super engaged and even more excited about what we do than, than than normally. So it's really great to see the kids talk about it. And 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 Amy, one of our teachers who used the SimCity in their in their classroom. So, but what I wanted to focus on, con, you know, connecting to this discussion what we're having here, is that really um, the question of like why 
why would you use that, and also what um, what challenges you can expect. And I'd rather embrace them openly and and talk about them and how we can overcome them. So the um, let's start with the good stuff, and and I just try to like pull out themes from the video, right? So you could hear very early on that that the kids were saying, oh, it's a it's a real world it's a real world thing. So it's like just as being in the real world. So that kind of giving context in the real world to apply those skills, it's just something that, that's amazing, I think, and that's what, what uh, good learning video games, digital games can do. And then, and then we also heard like context words um, saying it's challenging, right? It's, it's, it's not an easy thing. It's, it's tough. And the reason it's tough, of course, because it gives you all those feedback loops, it gives you all those rewards, it gives you all, all the smiley faces, and, and so on and so forth. So, so that's definitely a big positive. And, and, and the, the third one that I wanted to highlight that I don't think we talked about too much is that it gives you a super, super rich environment of data, um, you know, big data, if you want to use fancy terms these days, that allows you to, to go super more it down and, and, and analyze and see uh, data points that, that otherwise you probably won't have time to do in your classroom. And certainly you wouldn't have time to do it on an individual basis of all your 30 kids or uh, how many kids you have in your classroom. So that data um, is, just, is just absolutely rich and, and, and super, um, it's, it's just a source that's, a, that's a, like a golden pot. Um, that you can hit, and um, and so these are the, these are the absolute positives that I heard during the video, and I just wanted to highlight that that you know how engaging it was and how motivation it was it was in for the kids. Now, of course, you know it, the the challenges, and and again, I I'm saying these because I I want to uh, I want to ask uh, you know audience as well as the others if you have uh, come across that, and maybe we could take it offline afterwards to uh, brainstorm how to uh, overcome them. So the one is the, the obvious, is the barrier to entry, the, the IT uh, limitations, your proxy, your video cards, and all that. Um, but but I, I think there might be other problems as well. If you watch the video, there were kids talking to each other, forming groups, right? And, and, and becomes the barrier or the, or the diff difficulty of designing a game for, for someone um, as an individual and tracking that individual data points in a classroom, it becomes murky because you have you have and for a good reason you have the kids working together, and so that social interaction will always be in the hands of the teacher. So I think by saying this limitation and embracing it and offering it as as a powerful tool for the teacher to to harness is something that these games can can do well. And so I'm going to stop now and and let much more knowledgeable teachers respond to that. Thanks, yeah, we'll do that. Elena, is it ready for those, the questions? Sure. Okay, we are, so we're gonna take some questions from uh, viewers right now. Yeah, so we have a few good questions that have come in. Um, first of all, do you find that students get bored with non-tech more quickly now that they're exposed to all these cool technologies in schools? Anybody? Teachers. <laughs> I don't think that students um, get more bored with uh, non-tech than they did before. I think students get bored with uh, boring materials, um, and that can be tech or not tech. I think, um, I, as a math teacher, I know I'm guilty of providing students with boring materials um, from time to time. And I don't think it matters. Like, I've done that, you know, with a screen and with a piece of paper. Um, so I think, you know, our challenge is to find high power, high leverage materials that are digital and analog um, and, and then use the ones that work, you know. When it, when it works well, you know, keep it and make it better. If it doesn't work, then throw it out. I know that I've I've tried to do like find digital solutions for problems and those have failed and and I found a paper based solution that worked better and with the students were more engaged with so mm. uh, Tanya yeah. Too. oh yeah I was just gonna say um, 
that I actually use a lot of card games in my classroom and I feel like um, it's always like something that the students are familiar with so I have a conjugation card game that is similar to the game of Uno and students love Uno so they actually have a um, have a blast playing that game and whenever if ever we run out of uh, my lesson is short then we just end and they get into groups of two or three and play that game so and they're still just as engaged as they were when we were building things on Minecraft so I'm just gonna make your statement, Chris, and what you just kind of echoed, Tanya, that like if the thing is good, they'll like it. If it's boring, they'll be bored. And uh, some of these things that you're we're creating and giving them are just better things, so they'll be used to better things now. Is that kind of <laughs> that's what I heard? Um, Claudio or Tamash, or next question? I just feel exactly like Chris and Tanya. Like, it doesn't matter, like, based on our uh, experience with games and game-like experiences, it doesn't matter if it's digital or non-digital. For example, a good game, it's, it's a good game uh, given, like, it, it doesn't matter the form that it takes. It's just that you need to take care of, like, making it engaging, making it meaningful, and then if it's digital or non-digital, that's, that's secondary. I would, yeah, I, I totally agree everything said before. I would still push for, you know, on the digital side, not surprisingly, you know, being, coming from Glass Lab. But, um, but it, it, it's also a personal, you know, conviction. I believe in that, 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 that we, we are, you know, I, I see my own kids and, and, and see, you know, how they, they are drawn to the, the technologies in a much faster pace than we are necessarily. And, 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 it's our job to keep up with them. So, so embracing more and more digital, um, it's 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 going to be key. It's it's not something that that we can overlook. So it's it's coming whether or not we are on that train. And I'd like to be us all on that train. Okay, great. Um, we have another question um, around how do you balance using the tool and teaching. Does anybody want to jump in there? Shall I call on someone? <laughs> this is a good teaching uh, pedagogy, by the way. Randomly calling on people who are mildly afraid. Um, no one? I can, I can start very quickly. Uh, from my experience, like, using the tool is teaching. Like, there is no, like, otherwise, if, if using the tool is not teaching, then there is some kind of problem with the tool itself or how it has been integrated with the teacher. Uh, so to me, if the, the tool and the activities designed around the tool uh, are meaningful and well designed, using the tool is teaching. Yeah, I guess um, I was attempting to interpret the question and I was thinking about, like, if you're, if you're a language arts teacher using a novel to teach something, like, you're using the tool, I guess you're reading the book, but then you're, you're kind of guiding the students through the book. So if I'm playing a game with students like Dragon Box and I'm using the tool, I show them maybe some strategies to play the game, but I'm also, I guess, really putting the tool in their hands, letting them, letting them use the tool and then using those experiences to build their knowledge and their skill base. And I'm just going to uh, hype what Chris said just a bit because I know what he's talking about. Um, Chris not only used the game itself and kind of uh, surrounded it with uh, various activities, but he, he would kind of uh, make analog versions of things that were in the digital game so that students kind of had a, a cross game and, uh, you know, physical world reality for that. So he would have, uh, that was kind of vague, he would have little cards that would mimic some of the functions and mechanics in the game Dragon Box. Dragon Box, for those of you who don't know, is an algebra game. A very good one, I think. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that got out there for Chris. He did a really cool thing. Anybody else? Or next question? Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so the last question is a pretty good one. Um, so we've heard a lot about the ways in which game designers like Claudio support teachers like Atanya and Chris at Quest to Learn. Um, what about the schools that don't have a Claudio, that don't have um, a game designer? Mm 
I, I think it goes back again to that to that point where what I asked before um, of that we as designers have a responsibility of creating these games that they are scalable, that they can uh, truly access are accessible without without geniuses like Claudio supporting you. And I think I think it becomes um, it, it it truly becomes a a conversation an interaction. Um, that, for example, we do in Glass Lab is that um, we're we're building a huge network of you know Glass Lab teachers network, educators network, uh, and anybody wanted to join, please uh, drop me an email after this. But um, that's the idea. It, it's a conversation. It's a dialogue, a partnership, where where the teachers can can have real impact on the development of these games and and any games for that matter. So it needs to be it needs to be a, a dialogue that happens. To, to make those games the, with the right support materials. And to echo Tamash, from my point of view, yeah, true, what we did with uh, Atari and Chris also, uh, with Minecraft, it, it can look really, really complex, and some, at some point it is, but uh, Tamash was just saying before that there is a responsibility in the design of these environments and these games and these tools, and for example, if you design a game uh, with the properties and affordances of Minecraft, you're already taking into account for the players to basically become designers. And there are so many games like that which basically are called sandbox games, but there are also many other games that give you that power too without being sandboxes. And um, it's important also to keep in mind that yes, it's it's uh, it's uh, it can be a f uh, you know you, c you can be afraid about using these new games because they are completely new environments to you. But usually around these games that enable you to create things, there are huge communities. So for example, around Minecraft, there are forums, there are tutorials, there are actual people you can refer to in order to build your knowledge. And so it just takes you know, that step to connect and choose the right tool and the right environment uh, to become a designer. I'd also just like to highlight the, um, the connection between Atanya and Tamash's comments. Tamash about kind of following the future into the digital, and and Atanya um, kind of being com more comfortable following our students with what they're comfortable with and learning from them. There seems to be a kind of a common ground there somewhere. Yeah, and I I, I think that <clears throat> teachers who don't have a Claudio but have an idea, then. They, what they need to do is, is find out how to connect the idea. So if they, they see a game, like on their Twitter feed, or they see a game that they go to a, a conference, a professional conference, and they see somebody talking about a game, you know, figure out what it is you want your students to learn that that game or that tool can help them learn, and then try it. Like, don't be afraid to bring it in the classroom and let the kids play with it. And, and then think about, okay, now how can I harness that excitement that the students had to reach my learning goal. And there are there's like many, many online forums and of communities of people who would love to hear your idea and, and push you further. Um, so I would I would say, you know, seek out those resources. I'm gonna thank you all before Elena does. Thank you all very much. Then I'm gonna say <laughs> then I'm gonna say to Elena, <laughs> thank you guys for your time. It's great to have you. And thank you, everybody, again. Uh, to find out about the next episode of Playtime, you can sign up for our mailing list. Just click Join Us at the top of this page. And if you'd like to suggest a webinar topic, um, you can use the contact link above. Thanks for watching, everyone. And if you like what we're doing, please spread the word. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>